So I've been talking to Luis and Paul who developed the game tools for Houdini. And we were surprised how many things you could actually do that do not necessarily have something to do with games using their tools. And today I want to show you one thing that might be useful for you if you happen to have a project for which you'll need to visualize geodata. And what I want to do is match up topography data, that means radar scan data of our Earth, with actual map data coming in through OpenStreetMaps OSM. In order for that to work, what I first want to do is head to the Games Tools tab and click Update Toolset. Because I think there is a fix, an update that Paul pushed that is quite useful for us. So let's click that. Let's uncheck the production builds only because I think it's in a really new build. And let's use the 1.37 here and click update. So we now need to restart Houdini. So let's do that. And here we are. So what I want to do after dropping down a geometry, diving in there, deleting the file is I want to press tab and under game dev, I'm looking for these two things here, namely the game dev OSM import. And what that does is it imports OpenStreetMaps data. However, we need to get OpenStreetMaps data to import first. So where do we get them? Well, under openstreetmap.org slash export, you get this here, a map of our beautiful world with this weird interface here and a few download options. And this weird interface is telling OpenStreetMaps which rectangle in latitude and longitude it should download. And yes, of course, we could manually select an area like this and it'll automatically update the coordinates up here. However, what I want to do is I want to match this data with elevation data. That means with a radar scan of the Earth that tells us how high a given point is on the Earth. OSM weirdly does not support that yet, or at least not on a wider scale. So I need to match it with another data set. And luckily there is this, and I'll put a link in the description as well. This is the 30 meter SRTM tile downloader. SRTM stands for the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, I think. A mission that NASA flew in the year 2000 and that scanned major parts of the Earth at a resolution of 30 meters. And this allows me to download a tile or the data set in tiles. For example, here, part of the Azores, when I click on that, I can see this is the coordinate of the lower left point of that tile. So I'm going to download that here. Just click download DM. If you're not registered with NASA, You'll have to do that, but it's free and NASA is really an awesome organization. So there is no reason not to do that. And then we just downloaded this zip file here just to talk a bit about these coordinates here. Lower left is north 39, west 32. However, in order to specify which area to download with OpenStreetMaps, we also need the upper right bound. So let's, for example, look at this here. So the lower left of this tile here is north 38, west 29. And this is north 38, west 28. So the second coordinate in this quadrant of the Earth declines. And let's click on this tile up here. And the first coordinate increases. So this tile here would be from north 39 and west 32 to north 40. It increases and west 31. So let's head over to OpenStreetMap and download the same quadrant here. And OpenStreetMap's coordinate system works tiny bit differently. So when we roughly circle in or rectangle in that part of the Azores that we want to download, you can see these coordinates here. So West 32 is displayed as minus 32. And we want to download this until West 31. That's minus 31. And we want to download from 39 to 40 like this so that we have matching tiles. I usually download using the overpass API, just clicking here and it downloads this file just called map. Let's head to the folder where we downloaded this and maybe just copy it over just to our current work folder. And also let's rename it from map.osm to maybe zores.osm like this. Also, let's open up the zip file with the SRTM data that we downloaded and it's got this weird file here. So north 39 with 32, that's the coordinate HGT. I think that's short for height. However, how can we read this out? So let's copy this into our work folder as well. And just for simplicity's sake now, call this azores.htt as well. Took me a while to figure out how to easily read out the data in here. The easiest way I found is using Photoshop to import the data. So in Photoshop, in order to open up this file, I need to rename it again. And for Photoshop to be able to read this file, I'll attach the file suffix raw for raw data. And now I can open this up using my old Photoshop. And in my Photoshop raw options, I can see the dimensions match up That's the dimension of one tile of data. And also I have to select depth 16 bits and byte order Mac and channel count set to one, then hit OK to import. And we see just these few white spots. So just to verify that there is data in there, let's just add an adjustment layer with exposure. And let's set the image mode to 32 bits. And let's not flatten it. So up here, 
let's just dial up the exposure. And I can see this is the incoming altitude data with these white spots. And those white spots are arids. We'll talk about filtering them out in Houdini later. So let's get rid of the adjustment layer and just save this file. And let's save it as a TIFF file without any profile. Azores.tiff is fine and save. Just make sure to save it as a 32-bit TIFF. All right, so that we have our both data sets downloaded now, let's head back into Houdini and into the OSM import here and let's select the OSM file we just downloaded. Azores OSM, there it is, hit accept. And then it takes a while to import and read this. So let's hit space and H to center on the whole data. And you can see this is the OSM data coming in, containing not only roads and a bit of terrain data, but also, I don't know, ferry routes. I have no clue what this is, but we can filter this out because when we go into the geometry spreadsheet, you can see in the primitive attributes, we get a whole lot of data. So the data on OSM has been thoroughly tagged and all these tags come in here. So maybe these are sea marks or some borders in the sea. I don't know what they are, but it doesn't matter for now. Another thing that comes with the OSM data, and this is only in the daily builds now, I think, is latitude and longitude of the original point before the latitude longitude coordinate system got translated into our X, Y, and Z coordinates. And we're going to use these coordinates here, latitude and longitude, to match up the points to our SRTM data. But let's import the SRTM data first. For that, I'm going to create a grid, set it to 3601 rows and 3601 columns like in the SRTM data that we downloaded. Let's just highlight it and again, hit space and H to center on it. There it is, really fine resolution. Let's add an um, attrib from map and we'd like to export a float, call it alt for altitude. Let's load in the TIFF file we exported from Photoshop, azores.tiff, wire this up here, highlight it, takes a while to cook and we don't see anything yet. That's totally normal because what we did is just write the altitude attribute onto each point. In order to actually evaluate this data and turn it into a height field, let's drop down a point wrangle. And in the point wrangle, what I'll first do is I will read in the altitude attribute and let's call the thing that we're calculating the offset. So float offset equals to float altitude attribute. And then we have to convert this. So the altitude in our SRTM data goes from minus one to plus one and needs to be multiplied by 32,767 in order to convert the grayscale values into meters. So let's do that times 32,767.0, that is meters. And what I like to do is I like to add a scaling factor here. What we could do is depending on the latitude and longitude of the tile we downloaded, we could calculate the edge length of the tile, which can be a bit troublesome because we are dealing with distortion due to projection on a globe. And then we could multiply this factor with the actual height stored in our SRTM data, but that's a bit too elaborate for now. So let's just add a float slider, call this one amp for amplitude, create the slider. Let's set it to one for now. And then now that we calculated the offset, let's add it to our points Y position. So v at p dot y plus equals offset. Let's highlight this and keep our fingers crossed. Again, due to the resolution of the grid, this takes a while to cook and we can see a massive height field. So let's decrease the amplitude. And when I zoom in, we can see the Azores islands appearing and these streaks here. And these streaks are sensor errors in the data, those white dots we've seen on Photoshop. So how do we get rid of them? Last time I checked, there was no point on Earth higher than Mount Everest, which is close to 9,000 meters, 8,800 something, I think. So let's in here just check if our offset is higher than, say, 10,000 meters for a good measure. And if it is so, let's put those points in a group, call it error. And also what I want to do is, in this case, set the offset to zero, like this. Let's call the group error with one R, like this. And you can still see those streaks. And they come from our attribute from map trying to interpolate the data. So in the filter settings, head to filter and set it to point so we don't blur out or filter the data. And now I got rid of those errors because I just set them to zero. However, in some cases, and let's just set our point color for all the points in the error group to maybe red. So those tiny points here are the 
points that I want to correct. And sometimes setting them to zero is not appropriate. So what I could do instead is down here, add an attrib blur, wire this in, and I'd like to blur the alt, the altitude, but only for our arrow group. So that again takes a while, lots of points to blur here. And let's set the blurring iterations to maybe eight in this case. No huge areas, for bigger areas, you would need more blurring iterations. And then again, what I can do is just copy this point wrangle here, reappend it below my attrib blur. And then in here, I wanna run this over the arrow group only. And again, for those, calculate the offset. We don't have to check all this, we already took care of this. And then again, apply the offset to the points position. Let's highlight this. And now what I didn't take care of before blurring the altitude, I didn't set this to zero either. So I only set the offset that we calculated from the altitude to zero, but let's also set the altitude to zero in this case. Now I correctly blurred that out. So those points fit nicely into the contour of the rest of the terrain. So again, what we did is just we checked if we have an altitude above 10 kilometers, and if we have, so for this point, we set it in a special group called error, we set the offset to zero and the altitude to zero for this point and just colored it. So let's get rid of the color here. Then after we did that, we blurred out the altitude attribute in these erroneous areas, just to make them fit into the whole terrain a bit better. And then just for these erroneous areas, we calculated the offset and moved the points in that direction. Okay, so now that we finally have our filtered and corrected altitude data mapped to this plane, Let's fit the OpenStreetMap data to it. And what we'll be using is the latitude and longitude data coming in through our OSM import. However, my grid, and let's for now, just for speed's sake, dial back its resolution here. For now, my grid does not have latitude and longitude data on each point. So let's generate that. Again, using a point wrangle. And when I go back to the OSM import here and head to the geo spreadsheet and go to the detail attributes, I can see I've got a maximum latitude longitude and minimum latitude longitude. And that should in theory be equal to the coordinates of the tile that we downloaded. So let's use that down here in the point wrangle where we generate coordinates for our points. So I wanna create four floats, call it max latitude, and it should be equal to the detail attribute coming in through our OSM called max underscore lat. So coming in through our first geo slot, that's this here, max underscore lat. And let's just copy this, paste it, do the same thing for the longitude. Copy those two lines and paste them again. And let's do the same thing for the minimum latitude and minimum longitude, like this. Also what I wanna do is I want to round them because sometimes my OSM import has some jaggies to it, so it's not exactly a whole number. However, we are aware that the way we are downloading the data, the latitude and longitude values will always be integers. So let's round them to an integer just to be sure, like this. What I wanna do using those min and maximum values now is for each point generate a latitude and longitude coordinate. And what I need for that are relative coordinates first. So when I look at my grid, I want to have coordinates ranging from 0, 0 on the one corner to 1, 1 on the other. And although I could use a bit of arithmetic to come up with those in my point wrangle, the simpler thing is actually use a UV texture node to generate those coordinates because UV textures are nothing more than relative coordinates on a plane when set to orthographic and projection axis is the Y axis in this case. Let's set the attribute class to point, wire this in, and I now checking against my geometry spreadsheet, have UV coordinates here, going from zero, zero, all the way to one and one. So in the point wrangle, after I read in the maximum minimum latitude longitude, let's use that together with our UV coordinates to generate lat long coordinates for each point. Let's create a float, call it long for longitude, and let's use a fit function to fit our UV dot x coordinate, which ranges from zero to one. So I can use the fit one function, which assumes all the inputs are mapped in the range zero to one, which they are in our case. And let's fit that to the minimum longitude and the maximum longitude. And of course, this needs to be spelled like this. Let's copy this line here, paste it, do the same thing for the latitude. Only using the uv y coordinate now, and our min lat and max lat values like this. 
Finally, let's write that out to another vector. Let's create it. Just set its z component to zero like this. Write it out as a point attribute. Let's check in the geo spreadsheet. Yeah, ranging from 39 minus 32 to 40 minus 31. Now, finally, that we have this, we can use a final point wrangle to match our lat long coordinates from the OSM to the lat long coordinates we just generated for the SRTM data. To do that, let's just copy a few lines here to get a maximum and minimum values. Just now they're coming in through our first slot. That is the one with the ID zero. The latitude and longitude coming in through the OSM are separate floats. So latitude is one, longitude is another. Let's convert them to a vector. Let's call this one OSM lat long. Again, the third component, just set it to zero. And what we now finally have to do is just use UV sample to sample the grid's position on the respective latitude and longitude coordinate. So our OSM data's points position equals to the UV sample. We want to sample the points of the grid coming in through our second slot. That's the one with the ID one. We want to sample the position. We want to use the lat long vector we generated on this grid here. And we want to sample it on the position coming in through OSM underscore lat long like this. And we can now see with one click, the OSM data is now fitting to our grid. Let's just increase the offset here and we have to increase both offsets. So let's just right click on the first one, go to copy parameter and in the second point triangle, just paste this as a relative reference like this. And now let's increase it like this and we can see the OSM data follows the terrain. And that is how you match up OSM and SRTM data. Technique I found myself using for a project that required me to visualize map data and geo data. Also, I'd like to point out that although we did lots of VEX wrangling in this one just to match up the data, the game tools have quite a few tools that are relevant not only to game developers, but also to motion artists, motion graphics artists, and also to VFX artists. So if you're into this stuff, just give them a try. SideFX has a bunch of really neat video tutorials on their tools, and maybe you find something that you can use in production. Again, huge thanks to all of our patrons. Without you guys, we wouldn't been able to do what we do. And a special thank you goes out to Mohamed Al-Abri, Joseph Howerton, John Koontz, Nick Nick, Chris Hebert, Rafik Anadol, and Rob Bryan Jr. Thanks, guys. So with that, I hope you had fun. Hope to see some examples where you use those techniques. And until next time, it's cheers and goodbye.